All right, well, good morning, everybody. As the children are being dismissed for junior church, let's take our Bibles this morning and open them to Genesis 46 and verse 28. We're going to try to finish Genesis 46 today. I, I said try. The title of our message this morning is Separation and Sanctification. And as you're turning there, I want to once again um, invite you to vote and participate in the upcoming uh, election. Uh, Early voting in Texas, I think, is going to go all the way through Friday, if I have that right. And then the following Tuesday is Election Day. I've shared with you some statistics that an estimated 30 million churchgoers are expected to sit out the election, and we don't want to be that, that here at Sugarland Bible Church, do we? We don't want to be singing, uh, standing on the promises while we're sitting on the premises, as the saying goes. And uh, our family had a chance to vote. My daughter, who's right up here, who's 18 years old, she voted for the very first time. That was, that was neat. I remember when I voted the first time, felt like I had an ownership a little bit, which is what our Constitution uh, gives us. And I would very much encourage you to take personalities and put them aside and vote policy. And by the way, Jesus is not on the ballot, so don't look for perfection. You can't find it this side of eternity. But you just ask yourself, and by the way, it's not just the presidential ballot. As you go in and vote, you'll see there's numerous uh, offices and some really important bond issues. So you sort of just ask yourself, you know, which of these are closer to life? Which of these are closer to pro-Israel? Which of these are closer to maintaining our freedom to fulfill the Great Commission? Uh, Which of these options are going to give me as the parent more authority over the direction of my own children and family? So it's not a terribly complicated process. You just go in and you've got your Bible in your mind, some key passages, and you run it through that grid and then you vote according to God's will. So probably I've said enough about that, amen? Amen. Um, the title of our message is Separation and Sanctification. The nation of Israel has been birthed, birthed through the patriarchs Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. As God has made to Abraham certain unconditional promises, and those promises have been passed down from Abraham to Isaac, from Isaac to Jacob. And so the nation of Israel is up and running at this point. We have the 12 tribes, or Jacob's dozen, who will be the progenitor of the 12 tribes. The problem, though, from the human standpoint, is if God leaves this new nation, which is a very significant nation. I mean, if you don't have Israel, you don't have Jesus, right? Christianity has no ability to explain its existence without Israel because everything that we have received has come to us through Israel by God's design. When he formed this nation, he said, I will bless the world through the nation of Israel. Israel, interestingly, can explain its its existence without Christianity But Christianity has no ability to explain its existence without the nation of Israel. So this becomes a very key nation in the outworking of God's purposes. And if God were to leave Israel where they were in Canaan, they would have most likely morally self-destructed. We see evidence of that in Genesis 38. 
So what God is doing is he is taking his special nation and he is moving them into a place of incubation outside of Canaan for 400 years. And it's from that place of incubation 400 years later, as Israel will be preserved, that God will lead them out of Egypt in an event called the Exodus. And so this transition and this movement of Israel from Canaan to Egypt is a big deal. And of course, when God does a work, he typically selects someone to be his instrument in that work. And the man that God has selected was a 17-year-old named Joseph, whose story is given to us in Genesis 37 through 50. And it's been quite a bumpy ride for Joseph, wouldn't you say? But now we've reached a point in the Joseph story where everything that God wanted to do in and through Joseph is now coming to fruition. Joseph has identified himself to his brothers who had betrayed him. There's a sort of a reconciliation, if you will, between these groups, and now it's Joseph's command under Pharaoh's authority to his brothers to go get dad, Jacob, and the rest of you with everything that you have and leave Canaan and come here to Egypt. And so we have the sojourn from Canaan to Egypt by the nation of Israel. This, of course, is critical to the preservation of the nation. If the nation is not preserved, God can't do what he wants to do in and through that nation, such as bring the scripture and the Messiah to the world. So what we're looking at here, it kind of reads, if you don't have this background, is just kind of some boring history, but don't look at it that way. Look at it as a key a link in the chain of divine events. As the nation is now being summoned out of Canaan into Egypt, and what happens there in Genesis 46, verses 28 through 34, which we're gonna look at here, is now Jacob and his family finally arrive in Egypt. So you'll notice the arrival that starts there in Genesis 46 and verse 28. It says, now he sent Judah before him to Joseph to point out the way before him to Goshen. So here is this group, they're leaving Canaan and they're coming to Egypt and there's gonna be now a reconciliation between Jacob and Joseph where the two haven't seen each other for 22 years. In fact, during much of that time, Jacob the father thinks that Joseph is dead and he's gonna discover here, or he has discovered that he's alive And not only is he alive, he's the second in command over all of Egypt. And now the two are gonna come face to face in verse 29. But as the family, including Jacob, is making its way from Canaan to Egypt, you'll notice that Judah, one of the 12, is kind of sent out ahead of time to sort of, you know, prepare the way and to sort of guide the way. And this is very interesting because what you're starting to see in this Joseph account is Judah of the 12 is moving into the forefront. You see there in verse 28, the first part of the verse, you see Judah moving into a leadership position. Now keep your eye on Judah because you're gonna start seeing this more and more as we wrap up, assuming we ever do before the rapture. As we wrap up the book of Genesis, where Judah is becoming more prominent. In fact, this prominence is going to accelerate to the point where when we get to the end of the book of Genesis, Jacob is going to have a series of prophecies that he will make over his 12 sons. And we learn in Genesis 49 and verse 10 that the Messiah, the king, Jesus himself will come through the lineage of Judah. Genesis 49 verse 10 of that prophecy says the scepter, that's authority, 
shall not depart from Judah, nor the Shiloh's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the nations. And it's interesting that when you move into New Testament times, the Jews, because of Roman occupation, had felt that God had broken his word. Because here they were under Roman occupation in Shiloh, the Messiah has never come from the tribe of Judah, not understanding that God had kept his word. Because the Messiah was born in a town about two miles, really, relative to Jerusalem in a place called Bethlehem, in fulfillment of Micah 5 verse 2. And so we have records of the leadership within the nation of Israel sort of, you know, putting, uh, putting on sackcloth and ashes and mourning and groaning and sort of going through the streets thinking that Genesis 49 verse 10 had never been fulfilled. God broke his word because here we are under Roman occupation and Shiloh is not here, but he was there. He was there in the form of an infant born in Bethlehem. So God kept everything that he ever said in these messianic prophecies. The reason why the nation of Israel continued on under Roman subjugation is because the nation of Israel rejected their king. Had they received the king on the king's terms, Roman subjugation would have ended. So the problem with a lack of fulfillment of these prophecies was not God, it was their interpretation of the prophecy. And it was their inability or unwillingness, I should say, to respond the way God wanted his special nation to respond. But all of this is coming to Israel through the tribe of Judah. In the book of Revelation chapter five, there's a giant seven sealed scroll and that scroll is very, very significant because it represents the title deed to the earth. As long as that scroll is rolled up and sealed, the title deed to the earth remains under the control of the devil. The title deed to the earth has been under Satan's control ever since Genesis 3, the fall of man. And in that heavenly scene in the book of Revelation chapter 5, Heaven itself, John himself, who's seeing these things, starts to weep, starts to cry uncontrollably. And why is he crying? Because he sees that seven-sealed scroll continuing to be rolled up. In other words, no one is qualified to open the seven-sealed scroll. And if that happens, then the title deed to the earth remains under the devil's control forever. I mean, that's reason to cry, don't you think? But what happens in Revelation 5 is John is told to quit your crying. <laughs> Stop weeping. Revelation 5 verse 5 says, One of the elders, this is in heaven, said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion from that is from the tribe of Judah. The root of David has overcome so as to open the scroll and its seals. In other words, there is somebody that's qualified to open this scroll. And that person that opens it is none other than Jesus Christ. And why does he have the qualifications? Because he's from the right tribe, he's from the tribe of Judah. He's fulfilling Genesis 49 and verse 10. And at that point, heaven stops crying, John stops crying, and he starts to rejoice. I mean, there's nothing as depressing as believing that the world in its current state is just going to continue on like this forever. And as Christians, we have such a different outlook on it. Things can be bad today, but they're just temporary. There's a new world coming. Do you believe that? A lot of our youth, a lot of your children and your grandchildren don't believe this because what they're taught in the school system to a large extent is uh, evolutionary dogma where, you know, we're just um, evolved apes, naked apes, I guess, and we're just going to continue to evolve upward, hopefully, in this state forever and ever and ever. 
And we wonder why our youth act like animals <laughs> when that's what they're taught. I mean, if you're taught you're an animal, you're probably going to act like that. And we wonder why they're slitting their wrists and injecting their bodies with all kinds of mind-altering substances, engaging in all these sorts of, you know, piercings of the body, slicing of the body, cutting of the body, things that are very, very unique to this generation. And we wonder why they're doing this. And the reason they're doing it is they're in pain. And of course they're in pain. I mean, I would be in pain too if I believed what they're taught, that this world just continues on as it's always been. But the Bible teaches, and this is what we call hope, prophetic hope, uh, eschatological hope, is this world is not going to continue on in its current state. There's a better world coming. In fact, what is happening right now is abnormal. Genesis 3 to all the way through Revelation 20, just before God dissolves this earth and replaces it with a new heavens and a new earth. Everything in between those markers is an abnormality. What is normal, as far as God is concerned, is Genesis 1 and 2, before evil entered our world. And Revelation 21 and 22, after evil will be completely taken out of the cosmos, because we'll be in a new heavens and new earth. If you want to study what's normal, study those four chapters of the Bible. Everything else in between is an abnormality. And yet, if you're told over and over again that what you see has always been and will always be, Darwinian evolutionary mindset, then that cuts out Genesis 1 and 2. It cuts out Revelation 21 and 22. And you just threw out the window the whole concept of hope. And when a person loses hope, they become very desperate. In fact, they've done experiments on laboratory animals, those that are sort of conditioned to believe that when they're thrown into a body of water that they're gonna be pulled out of that body of water very, very quickly. Those animals that think that have a tendency to be able to tread water longer. But animals that are conditioned to believe that once they're thrown into the body of water, they're never gonna get out again, they have a tendency to tread water uh, at a shorter uh, duration of time. And so when you take away hope from a human being, they become very desperate because we're designed to live with hope. They become very fatigued. They become very battle-weary. And how different the Christian message is that there's a better world coming. In fact, what is happening today is a grave abnormality it's not what God intended. And God, through the redemptive work of Jesus Christ, has moved heaven and earth to make sure that this problem is fixed. Uh, the price has been paid. The benefit is on its way. There's a better world coming. And that's what to communicate to your children and your grandchildren that are going through so much emotional turmoil uh, in this present world. And it starts here with Judah. We know that there's coming someone from the tribe of Judah who's going to fix man's problem. It's interesting that Judah is moving to the forefront um, when he's the fourth born, not the first born. Well, how come Re Reuben and Simeon and Levi are not moving to the forefront? Because Reuben, Simeon, and Levi disqualified themselves through their own behavior. Reuben, Simeon, and Levi are still very prominent in the millennial kingdom. They'll be there. Matthew 19 verse 28 says that. Ezekiel chapter 47 says that. But they forfeited a privilege that they could have had which is to be the tribe that brings forth the Messiah. That privilege fell to the fourthborn, not the firstborn or the secondborn or the thirdborn, because the first three, as we have studied in our chronological study of the book of Genesis, 
disqualified themselves through their own behavior. Now, what a lesson that is to us in the church age. You cannot do anything to remove your salvation. Once saved, always saved. If that weren't true, we wouldn't call it eternal life, right? Eternal life can't be eternal life unless it's eternal. And if I'm suddenly on probation where I could lose eternal life, then it's, it couldn't be called eternal life on the front end. So Jesus came into the world to give us eternal life. So once you place your trust in Christ as your Savior, your security is guaranteed. However, there are things that we can do in our sinful selves which disqualify us from how God wants to use our lives in the here and now. There are many, many people within the sound of my voice. There are many, many people that I can think of outside of the sound of my voice who are extremely gifted people who in the past God used in very strategic ways. And yet today, as I speak, they're sitting on the bench rather than being in the starting five because they did something in their ethical life. They did things in their moral lives, not to lose their salvation, but to disqualify themselves from leadership, usability, and ministry. And I concur with you that God is a God of forgiveness and God is a God of grace. I know many, many people that have fallen in ministry and tried to make some kind of comeback, but when you look at their lives and you look at their ministries and you look at their effectiveness and fruitfulness, it's not nearly what it used to be. And it really is not nearly what it could be. So this becomes the incentive to, one of the incentives, I should say, for pursuing the holy, holy life. Lord, thank you that once saved, always saved is a true doctrine. But you know, Lord, I don't want to do anything in my natural self that would somehow eclipse everything that you want to do in and through my life. There's a forfeiture with Reuben as we have studied. There's a forfeiture with Simeon and Levi as we have studied. And so this privilege in the outworking of God's purposes fell upon Judah. <coughs> but with Judah out in the forefront, the family now arrives in Goshen. Notice, if you will, uh, Genesis chapter 46 and look at the second half of verse 28. It says, they came into the land of Goshen. Goshen, of course, is a real place there in northern Egypt. Um, these are real places of geography, as we have studied. Egypt and Goshen are actual places that you can find on a map. And so God, in all of this, is saying the Bible is history. That's why these geographical places are given all of the time. These things really happened. And when God is teaching moral and ethical and spiritual lessons through these historical accounts, he wants us to understand that it's coming out of a history that is very, very real. There is no distinction between the historical and the spiritual as far as God is concerned. The spiritual truths are wonderful, but they came out of real historical examples. So this is not Jack and the Beanstalk stuff. This is not Veggie Tales. This is real history that transpired. The secularist is always trying to drive a wedge between the historical and the spiritual, but your Bible won't allow you to do that. Uh, even the resurrection of Jesus, Paul says in the resurrection chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, check it out for yourself. He appeared to 500 eyewitnesses, most of whom are still alive. So Paul couched his argument for the resurrected Christ in a real historical narrative, a real historical setting, and that's what's happening here. So they are taken out of Canaan and they're brought to Goshen, and they're not just brought to Goshen, they're brought to the best of Goshen. As was indicated would happen in Genesis 45, verse 20. For the best of all of the land of Egypt is yours. Genesis 
47 and verse 11 is going to call that the land of Ramses. So God is looking out for his nation as they're traveling. They're coming not just to the best, but to the best of the best. And God has orchestrated all of these circumstances because this is a special nation. From this nation, through Judah, is going to come the Messiah himself. And then you come to verse 29, where you have an actual meeting, if you will, between Joseph and Jacob. Uh, Notice what verse 29 says. And keep in mind that the two hadn't seen each other for 22 years. It says, Joseph prepared his chariot and went up to Goshen to meet his father. So think of two people being separated for 22 years. That's a long time. And think about the fact that for much of that 22 years, the father has felt the son is dead. He's discovering that he's not dead. He's a grown man now. He's not a 17-year-old anymore. This is 22 years later. And not only is he alive, but he is the second in command over all of Egypt. And you could see the emotion that would transpire with such a reunion. And as you look at the second part of verse 29, you see that emotion coming out in a full swing. It says, as soon as he appeared before him, he fell on his neck and wept on his neck. And notice what it says here, verse 29, for a long time. So there's a lot of crying that's taking place here between these two. Now, this crying and emoting and emotion, I believe, is typological. Joseph as we have tried to argue, is a type, if you will, of Jesus Christ. And if there's one thing that's very interesting about Jesus Christ, he was a man of tears. He did a lot of crying. Luke 19, verse 41, he was crying on Palm Sunday because he knew the nation would reject him. It says, when he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept over it. And Jesus in his incarnation did a lot of things like this. He knew how to work for a living. He knew what emotional distress was like. He knew what it was like to be emotionally troubled and thirsty and hungry and tired. You ever been tired? He knew what it was like to be sad. He, he knew what it was like, not in his deity, but in his humanity, to not really understand everything. I mean, he didn't even know when he was coming back. Think about that one. Matthew 24, verse 36. Have you ever had questions in your life that you just can't get resolved? Jesus in his humanity understands all of that. He knew what it was like to come under the influence of heavy temptation. Joseph crying is a typification of this. That's why there's so many references to the tears of Joseph as we've traveled through this account. Genesis 45, verses 1 and 2, he cried. Genesis 45, verses 14 and 15, he wept. He's weeping here. We're going to get to the end of the book of Genesis, and he's going to be weeping more. It says in Genesis 50, verse 17, and Joseph wept when they spoke to him. What a tremendous type that is of Jesus Christ a man of tears. In fact, Isaiah 53 and verse three calls Jesus 700 years in advance, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. You have the shortest verse in the Bible, John 11 verse 35, Jesus wept. And you say, well, interesting theology, but who cares? (laughs) Well, it's a big deal. Because when you go to Jesus, who is your high priest, and we're exhorted to go into the throne room of grace that we may receive help during time of need, you are not praying to some, you know, detached, disinterested figure. You're praying to someone who stood in your shoes and knows exactly what it's like to suffer. 
Hebrews 2 verse 18 says, for since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Hebrews 4 verses 15 and 16 says, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin, therefore let us draw near with confidence to the throne room of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Lord, I'm tired. The Lord says, I know all about that. Lord, I had someone stick their knife in my back that I trusted. Oh, the Lord says, I know all about that. That happened to me. Read the story of me and Judas in the New Testament. Lord, I, I, I am so weak and I am so tired, I, I'm going to fall under temptation. The Lord says, I know all about that too. Draw near to me in those circumstances and I will give you the strength that you need. I'm not the basketball coach that has never played the game. I've made reference to this before, but as I went through my basketball years, seventh grade all the way through college... Senior year, I had coaches that had never played and coaches that had. When a coach who's never played the game is yelling and screaming at you and telling you to work harder and endure more to get into shape, etc., he really doesn't have your respect because he's never been in your shoes. But the coach that has played, it's completely different. He knows exactly the pain that you're going through. And that's what we have in the incarnate Son of God, the, the God-man to his eternally existent deity at the point of the virgin conception was added humanity and he stood in our shoes and he's lived amongst us and he knows what we're experiencing. And that's what makes him such a powerful and effective, and what does it say here, sympathetic high priest. And this becomes the significance of Joseph just overwhelmed with emotion and weeping when he sees his father that he hasn't seen for 22 years. Now, the best I can tell is this weeping goes two ways because I can't really, at least the way it's translated in English, I can't figure out exactly who's weeping. Is is Jacob weeping or is Joseph weeping? I think the answer is yes. I think they're both crying. And they're crying for a long time. Now, Joseph's weeping is a type of Jesus Christ. Jacob's weeping is a type of the conversion of Israel in the last days. There is going to be a reconciliation between the nation of Israel, largely in unbelief today, and Jesus Christ. And when that reconciliation takes place, which is yet future, the Jews are going to cry as if there's no tomorrow. It's predicted in your Bible. Zechariah 12 and verse 10 says, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace. Aren't you glad for grace? This is why God is able to take Israel back, despite the fact that they have been in disobedience and unbelief nationally for 2,000 years. It's grace. That's why God takes anybody back. I will pour on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication, and they will look at me whom they have pierced. Suddenly it dawns on them that we've had it wrong for 2,000 years. This guy Jesus that we rejected and actually turned over to Rome for execution, he he was our Messiah the whole time. The Antichrist at this point has betrayed us, the Jews will say. And the tears are going to flow. They will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. And they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. It's not just a few tears that are shed here. It's not just weeping. It's intense, bitter weeping with all of the emotion that that brings to our attention. The book of Malachi chapter 4 Verses 5 and 6, the very last prophet of the Old Testament. 
His name isn't Malachi, by the way, the only Italian prophet in the Bible. His name is Malachi. It says in Malachi 4, verses 5 and 6, this is how your Old Testament ends. Because as the Old Testament is ending, Israel is not trending right. And you start to wonder, well, is Israel ever going to get its act together? And so your Old Testament ends this way, Malachi 4, verses 5 and 6 Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. Well, who are the hearts of the children? That's the Israelis. Who are the hearts of the fathers? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Largely what Israel believes today is different than what Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob said and taught and role modeled. But there's coming a time in history where those two groups are brought back together and they're going to live in harmony with each other through the ministry of the prophet Elijah, probably spoken of there in Revelation chapter 11, where all of a sudden the hearts of the children, the nation of Israel, will be reunited with what the original vision was for Israel as given through the patriarchs. And as this happens, Zechariah says, the tears are going to flow and there is going to be a great reconciliation between the two. Isn't that what reconciliation is all about? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 and 19 says, Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus, and he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is the God, that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself and not imputing their trespasses to them and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Reconciliation basically means two parties are at war with each other and they're reunited. Isn't that what the message of the Bible is about? God reconciling the world to himself through Jesus Christ God reconciling Jacob and Esau together. God reconciling the nation of Israel back to the heart of the fathers in the end times. Isn't that what the Bible is all about? I bring this up because you might be struggling right now in your life with the issue of reconciliation. There might be someone that you're alienated from, isolated from, something went south something bad happened. You have to understand what the heart of God is in those circumstances. It's to bring conflicting parties back together. And consequently, that fits the Bible's big theme here of reconciliation. You look at verse 30 and you see Jacob uh, responding to this. Notice, if you will, Genesis chapter 46, and notice, if you will, verse 30. Notice what Jacob says when he comes back and he sees and is reconciled with Joseph, who he thinks has been dead for 22 years. It says, then Israel said to Joseph, now notice the switch of names here. First he's called Jacob, now he's called Israel. Why is there a switch of names between Jacob and Israel? Because he was given a new name, right? His new name was given to him by God, and that was the beginning of the nation of Israel. That's where this phrase, the nation of Israel, comes from. We would expect to see that, wouldn't we, in the book of beginnings? The book of beginnings talks about the beginning of everything. The universe, life, man, marriage, evil, clothing, religion, salvation, language, government, nations. We would have no knowledge of these things if it weren't for the book of Genesis. And one of the things we have knowledge of is Israel. Why does Israel exist? 
Where did Israel come from? Why is the nation of Israel given the name that it's given? And so you're going to see from this point on in the Bible, sort of uh, Jacob and Israel, the two names used uh, synonymously here. But as you come to verse 30, you see Jacob or Israel's response to his reconciliation to Joseph. And it says in verse 30, then Israel said to Joseph, now let me die. Since I have seen your face that you are still alive. I've seen it all, Lord. (laughs) Here's my favorite son, I thought he was dead. Not only is he alive, but he's second in command of Egypt. I've seen it all, Lord. Just, I'm ready to go home now. I'm ready to die now. You ever reached a point in your life where every single one of your dreams is materialized? And you just say to the Lord, you know, Lord, I don't think it's going to get much better than this. You know, I'm ready to die. By the way, what do you do when the Lord fulfills all of your dreams and expectations? Well, the first thing you should do is keep it to yourself because the rest of us might get jealous. But the Lord will bring you to those kind of places in your life where everything that you wanted has now been fulfilled and you're so overwhelmed by that that you say to yourself, well, if I died now and went to heaven, that would be enough. Psalm uh, 37 and verse four says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Jacob always wanted to see Joseph. He wanted to see him alive. He wanted to see him prospering, and now the Lord has so strategically worked in Jacob's life that he's seen it, and he says, there's really nothing better for me. I'd rather just die now and go home to be with you. Did God answer Jacob's prayer request? No, he didn't, because he lived 17 more years. (laughs) He is probably about the age of 130 at this time. Genesis 47, verse 9 says that. Genesis 47, verse 28 indicates that he would live to the ripe old age of 147, 17 uh, additional years in Egypt, and so the Lord kept him around even though he had reached a point in his life where he said, I've seen everything, everything has been fulfilled, the deepest desires of my heart have been granted, I would just assume to go home and be with the Lord. If God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, he could do that in your life, and we should be asking him for that. You know, Lord, take me to the point where every single expectation that I've ever had that's of you has been accomplished. And now what happens as you go down to verses 31 through 34 is Joseph begins to give instructions to his brothers. And you look at the first part of verse 31, it's very clear who he's talking to. It says, Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household. So the reconciliation between the groups has transpired. It's been so powerful that Jacob is saying, I I can die now. And here they are in Goshen, and Joseph starts to instruct his brothers related to what they're to say to Pharaoh as they're being settled in the land of Goshen. And so you go down to verses 31b to verse 32, and what you're to tell Pharaoh, Joseph tells his brothers, is that you guys are shepherds. You're shepherds. Kind of a strange thing. Why bring that up when Pharaoh interviews you? Well, we're going to get the answer at the end of verse 34. But here's the instruction given, verse 31. Joseph said to his brothers, and to his father's household, I will go up and tell Pharaoh and will say to him, my brothers and my father's household who are in the land of Canaan have come to me. And the men are shepherds, for they have been keepers of the livestock and they have brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. 
So Joseph is saying, here's what I'm going to tell Pharaoh. I'm going to tell him that you guys are shepherds. We're going to get an answer as to why in just a minute. And then Joseph said, Pharaoh is going to ask you some questions, and here's what you're to say in response. And you see that there in verses 33 and 34. Here's what he's going to ask you about. It's kind of nice to have an interview with somebody and you know the questions in advance. That's what Joseph is giving them. Kind of like some people running for office. It says in verse 33, when Pharaoh calls you and says, what is your occupation? So the first question Pharaoh is going to ask you as you're being settled in the land of Goshen is what do you guys do, you know, for a living? And you know what? That's exactly what Pharaoh asked. He asked it in Genesis 47 and verse 3. Over there, we'll say, then Pharaoh said to his brothers, what is your occupation? So they said to Pharaoh, your servants are shepherds, both we and our fathers. So how did Joseph know that Pharaoh would ask that question? Did Joseph have some kind of vision or prophecy? Uh, there are a lot of visions and prophecies given to Joseph in the book of Genesis, but there's no indication here that he had a, a vision or a prophecy. I think it relates to the type of relationship that Joseph had with Pharaoh. He knew Pharaoh so well that he could anticipate the questions that Pharaoh would ask. Genesis 45 and verse 8 says this, Now therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God, and he has made me a father to Pharaoh and the Lord of all of his household, and the ruler of all of the land of Egypt. In other words, God put Pharaoh and Joseph together. God put Joseph into a position where Pharaoh would look at Joseph as he was looking at his spiritual father. Now that's not something that Joseph could have pulled off on his own, but it's something that came to pass. It's something that came into existence. It's that discipler, disciple mentor, mentee type of relationship, and God took a 17-year-old kid and gave him that kind of relationship eventually, ultimately beginning around age 30 with Pharaoh. And God can do that in your life. He can put you into positions and he can put you into relationships with people where you have sort of a discipling relationship to them that you could not have put together on your own. And if that's happening in your life, if there's someone special in your life that God has allowed you to guide, disciple, mentor, maybe at the highest echelons of your corporation, business, that's a gift from God. And that's what Joseph had with Pharaoh, and that's how he knew Pharaoh so well that he told his brothers, here's what Pharaoh's going to ask you. So he's going to ask you guys, are you shepherds? And here's what you're supposed to say ahead of time. Verse 34. You shall say, your servants have been keepers of the livestock from our youth, even until now both we and our fathers. So when he asks this question, just tell him you're shepherds, which is a true statement. Now, we wrap up here, Genesis 46, with the reason why this disclosing to Pharaoh that these Hebrews coming from Canaan were shepherds is such a big deal. The reason is the second part of verse 34. All of verse 34 says, you shall say you are shepherds and have been keepers of the livestock from our youth, even until now, both we and our fathers, that you may live in the land of Goshen. Now watch this. For every shepherd is loathsome to the Egyptians. The Egyptians didn't like shepherds. In fact, the Egyptians didn't like Hebrews. The Egyptians didn't like Semites. The nation of Israel is Semitic. You might recall Genesis 43, verse 32. 
It says, so they served him by himself and them by themselves and the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves because the Egyptians could not eat bread with the Hebrews for that is loathsome to the Egyptians. So the Egyptians, pure Egyptians we're talking about, those coming from the line of Ham, didn't like Semites, they certainly didn't like Hebrews or Jews. And then if that weren't bad enough, not only do the Egyptians not like the Semites or the Hebrews, they especially don't like shepherds. So here's two negative marks against you guys from the rest of the Egyptians. Number one, the rest of the Egyptians aren't gonna like you because number one, you're Semitic. And number two, the rest of the Egyptians aren't gonna like you because you're shepherds. So the first thing you need to do is you need to tell Pharaoh as you're settling in the land of Goshen that not only are we Hebrews, but we're shepherds. Now that is the outworking of God's purposes. This detail is not given to us coincidentally nor accidentally. This is what God wanted to do all along. His goal was to take the nation of Israel outside of Canaan and take them to Egypt. Why did he want to take them outside of the land of Canaan? Because if they had stayed in Canaan, Genesis 38, they would have adopted the morality of the Canaanites. Then you ask yourself, well, how would that problem be fixed if he took them to Egypt? Wouldn't the nation of Israel adopted the polytheism, many gods idea from the Egyptian people and the Egyptian pantheon? No, that won't happen because the Egyptians are just going to leave you alone. Why are they going to leave you alone? Well, they're, they're racist, basically. They don't like Semites number one, and number two, they particularly don't like shepherds. So you're gonna be alone all by yourself in Goshen, not just Goshen, but the best of Goshen, the land of Ramses, and you're gonna be there for 400 years, and it's there I'm gonna isolate, incubate, and grow the nation, and this becomes the reason why God has done everything that he has done in the book of Genesis to bring the nation of Israel to this particular point. God knew this would happen. He took advantage of the racism and the detesting of the shepherds in the minds of the Egyptians so that the nation of Israel would be isolated. And why is God isolating the nation of Israel? It goes back to the title of this sermon, Separation and Sanctification. The nation of Israel cannot become what it's supposed to become when its morals are just the same as the surrounding countries. The nation of Israel has the power to speak as a prophetic voice into the surrounding nations when it's different than those other nations. This is why God works the way he works in our lives. He severs sometimes relationships that we, just, that we had previously with unsaved or worldly people. God takes those relationships and sometimes cuts them. Because what God says is, you know what? If you continue on in that relationship, they're gonna influence you more than you influence them. And at the end of the day, their morality is gonna be your morality. And once the Christian's way of thinking and the Christian's morality is just like the world, guess what, folks? We lose the ability to reach the world. There's no reason that the world should listen to us when our value system and our lifestyles are just like theirs. I mean, why would they listen? But when a Christian begins to walk in the walk of separation and begins to walk in the walk of progressive sanctification, what the Christian discovers is he or she has an automatic pulpit to the world. The world is listening to you because they really don't understand what makes you tick. 
why do you think so differently about things than I think about, the world will say. Why are you so calm in the midst of adversity, whereas if I were in your position, I'd be hitting the panic button? The world will take notice of that. You'll have an automatic pulpit when that happens. And it's not because you're different in the sense that you're weird or antisocial or obnoxious. It's, it's you're different in the sense of your thought pattern and what you're trusting in. And the world will take notice of that. You want to get the world's attention? Walk with Jesus in the midst of adversity. Experience the indwelling comfort of the Holy Spirit in the midst of adversity. You start doing that and sustaining that and achieving it by God's grace in your life. And suddenly the world can't really understand why you're doing it. And your answer is, there's someone bigger than myself doing it. But if, you're, if we are just going to be like the world in the midst of all kinds of circumstances, there's no way the world would ever pay attention to anything we have to say. This becomes the significance of God taking Israel out of Canaan. Genesis 38 would have been what the nation would have ended up being had God left them where they are and not incubated them and isolated them and separated them. It's the walk of sanctification. I am in the world. I can't leave the world. But that doesn't mean I have to be of the world. Uh, I have the same uh, connections in the world that you have with you know, going to your bank or dealing with someone that comes to fix your house or anything. But when they tell a filthy joke, I don't have to sit and laugh at it. I can interact with them, but when they tell a filthy joke or use the Lord's name in vain and they start laughing in a crazy manner, I don't have to laugh. And believe me, those little things will cause people to wonder, well, why aren't you laughing? I mean, the rest of us around the water cooler at work are laughing, but you're not laughing. Why, why is that? And this becomes the power of the sanctified lifestyle. The more sanctified we are in our daily life, the greater your sphere of influence related to those all around you that God wants to reach through you. This is why the book of Genesis gives us the account of Lot. You know, are you a lot like Lot, right? Who sojourned in Sodom. And when it got time to get serious, because the angel came to Lot, who happened to be a believer, by the way, 2 Peter 2, verses 7 through 8, says that very clearly. When it, time to get t when it came time to get serious, and the angel said, I've come to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, you got to get out of here and get your relatives out of here, Lot, who was living in complete and total compromise as we've studied in Genesis 19, spoke up. And he started to get serious about spiritual things, and his own relatives thought he was joking around. In fact, that's the only time, I think it's around Genesis 19, verse 14, right in there. It's the only time that the word jesting is used in the Bible. You know, there's Lot again joking around. He wasn't taken seriously by his own family because of his compromised lifestyle. When you see that, Genesis 19, you clearly see why God has done what he has done through Joseph to remove the nation of Israel from Canaan and incubate them for 400 years because the Egyptians hated the Semites. And they particularly detested the shepherds. Second Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17 in this walk of separation and sanctification says, Therefore come out from their midst and be ye what? Separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will welcome you. 
Remember when Babylon is destroyed in the book of Revelation, chapter 18 and verse 4? Remember what it says there of Babylon? It says, I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her, in her sins and receive her plagues. Christian, let me just ask you a question. Is there something happening in your life? Maybe the way you handle finances, maybe a thought pattern, maybe the way you're governing your emotions, maybe the way you're dealing with bitterness, maybe the way you're dealing with jealousy, maybe the speech that comes out of our mouths. Are there habits in our lives that really don't reflect our Christian calling and destiny? If so, there's no doubt in my mind that the Holy Spirit is placing many of us under conviction to not be that way. Don't live that way. Don't act that way. Why? Because you lost your salvation? No. It's God has too great of a purpose in your life to see it compromised by something like that. You have a prophetic voice to the world when our lifestyle is different than the world. And that becomes one of the great lessons that comes out of this. I'll close with this thought here. Every shepherd is loathsome to the Egyptians. How did the Egyptians look at shepherds the way you look at the lowest man on the totem pole? You know, the, the guy that comes in as the janitor and empties the trash and sweeps up kind of look down very sadly on people like that, very low on the socioeconomic status line. And that's how the Egyptians looked at the shepherds. Now, flash forward to the New Testament. Who were the very first to have disclosed to them the gospel? The shepherds. It's in Luke's gospel. Luke chapter 2 and verse 8, we read it on Christmas time. It says, in the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over the flock. Just what Jacob's sons did for a living. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone all around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there is, has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you, and you will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Old Testament Shepherds are the low of the low. New Testament, the first revelation of the gospel comes to shepherds. You see how different the way God thinks than man thinks? I mean, if I was going to write a story about a coming Messiah, I would make him in charge of some Fortune 500 company or run for president of the United States or come into the world to give orders and bark orders at people. But we know from the New Testament that the Son of Man has not come into the world to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus, when he came into the world, reversed the ordinary way people think about servanthood and humility. And that becomes, of course, a natural segue, if you will, into the gospel. This is why Jesus came into the world in great humility to give his life as a ransom for many, including you, including me. Every other religious system in the world, it doesn't read this way. The deity comes into the world to rule. And don't get me wrong, Jesus is going to have his share of ruling and reigning in the kingdom age, yet future. But that's not why he came the first time. He did not come to judge the world. He came to save the world. 
And that servanthood is pointed out where he even disclosed himself to the low of the low. The shepherds. He did it for us. So our exhortation to you is don't hold out for a better offer. <laughs> You're not going to get one. Jesus came into the world to live as a selfless, suffering, sacrificial servant and lamb to pay every single debt that I have ever racked up against God in my sinfulness. And his exhortation to me is not to try to fix the problem on your own, but to trust in my work of servanthood on your behalf 2,000 years ago. His final words on the cross were, it is finished. He's done all the work. And all we do as lost sinners is we receive as a free gift what he's done in our place. And there's only one way to receive a free gift, which is to believe. Believe means to trust in the finished work of the Savior, which he did in his humiliation and servanthood towards us. And so we conclude this message and all of our messages with that exhortation, reminding people that the price has been paid. Now receive what Jesus has done for you as a free gift 2,000 years ago in the, in the ultimate act of servanthood that you can imagine. Dying a horrific death on a cruel wooden Roman cross 2,000 years ago. Sort of prefiguring it in the upper room as Jesus got down on his hands and knees and began to wash the feet of the disciples. That blew their mind, particularly Peter. And yet Jesus said there to Peter, John 13, if you don't allow me to do this, you have no part of me. We have to receive what he has done in our place through sacrificial service. That sacrificial service being showcased even to the point where the first disclosure of this was to the loathsome shepherds there in the Bethlehem area. And so today we exalt in a suffering Savior who did so much to gain for us so great a salvation. If you've never trusted in Christ, I would ex exhort you, encourage you to do that now. If it's something you need more explanation on, I'm available after the service to talk. Shall we pray? Father, forgive us in our worldliness for forgetting the way you do things. You don't do things as man does things. You operate by a completely different way of thinking. We talk often, Lord, of your coming as a future judge, but you preceded that by coming as our sacrificial and selfless Savior. We praise you for these things. We lift them up in Jesus' name. And God's people said,